The Bane Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the fight to stop global communism before it takes hold, a wagon train to the stars, and we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of Timothy Zahn's Cobra, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afshirod. This week, Griffin Barber sat down with Robert E. Waters to discuss the latest entry in the Ring of Fire series, 1637, The Transylvanian Decision. Waters co-wrote the book with series creator, the late Eric Flint, and this novel was one of the last ones that Flint worked on before he passed away earlier this year, making the interview a must for fans of the series. But first, the news. The November mass market paperbacks are here. Let's take a look. First up, we have The Romanov Rescue by Tom Kratman, Justin Watson, and Casey Azell. Mankind's history is bound up in the fabric of fate, a strong cloth, tough and closely woven. Consider 1918, the last year of the greatest war in human history to date. As the belligerent stagger, Russia descends into civil war and chaos. It is there that a once mighty family awaits its fate. But even the strongest fabric has flaws. An escaped prisoner of war, injured but still highly capable, may be one. An airship at loose ends after a failed mission might be another. A German general suddenly coming face to face with the reality of the monster rising in the east could be a third. And if all these loose threads are somehow yanked out together, the effect just might be enough to tear the fabric of time and to rescue a desperate family, a family that happens to contain the last heirs of the czars of old Russia, and perhaps the Russia that is to come. Next up, we have Gunfight on Europa Station, edited by David Boop. The final frontier ain't so final in these 12 tales of space exploration and adventure. There's a story for everyone who's ever dreamed of taking that star dusty trail to the farthest stars, or of facing down a belligerent alien at high noon in a frontier settlement under the light of a strange sun. Get ready to hit the hyper thrusters as you set course for adventure, mystery, romance, and two laser gun slinging action. Yarns by Elizabeth Moon, Alan Dean Foster, Jane Linscold, Will McCarthy, Martin Shoemaker, Alex Schwarzman, and more. That's The Romanoff Rescue and Gunfight on Europa Station, both available now as mass market paperbacks. And that's it for the news. Hi there, I'm Griffin Barber, your host for today's edition of the Bain Free Radio Hour. Eric Flint was a modern master of alternate history, most famous for his 1632 series. He frequently collaborated with other excellent authors of the genre to produce new and fascinating worlds for his legions of fans, or as is in this case, to add to the largest, most inclusive universe ever devised, 1632, or the Ring of Fire. Eric did more for more authors than any other person in the genre, <clears throat> providing opportunity and advice to many, many authors, including myself. 1637, the Transylvanian decision was completed shortly before his death in July of this year. Author and editor Robert E. Waters got his start in tabletop gaming and continues to write for games companies, both tabletop and computer. His first fiction sale was to Weird Tales with subsequent short stories sold to a who's who of SF magazines and anthologies down the years. 1637, The Transylvanian Decision, is a second full-length novel in the 1632 series from Bain Books. Hello and welcome, Robert. Hi, Griffin. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. So the hardest question first, I like to you know start out gently. <laughs> what is the coolest aspect of 1637, The Transylvanian Decision, for you? Well, I could point out three or four things that I consider uh, very you know great and uh, um, uh, cool um, 
Um, but um, you know me, we go back a ways. Uh, I've been in the gaming industry for about 28 years. <clears throat> I have worked on many uh, board and more games in that time. So I would have to say that uh, the, 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 the coolest aspect of the novel in my mind are the battle scenes and the planning and preparation that the characters go through prior to the battles to prepare for the battles. You know, the, 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 the war councils that uh, um, Morris Roth and his lieutenants uh, engage in and his opponents, you know, the, the Wallachians and the Moldavians, they too engage in discussions about tactics and strategy and logistics and things of that nature. Those areas and those parts of the novel are in many ways just as important, if not more important than the battles themselves. Uh, because they help to define characters, motivations, interests, opinions. And so those combined with the battles, that's what I really, really enjoyed. And do you think that that was uh, one of the things that Eric was most into as well? Or, Well, that's a good question. And it, and it does lead to um, a quick, let me, let me give you a little bit of background of where we came to this decision to write this kind of novel. Uh, we started talking in 19, uh, 2019 about you know collaborating on something and Eric suggested that I give some recommendations as to what we might collaborate on. So one of the things that I did is I sent him the very first story that I wrote in the series, The Game of War. It was set in um, Switzerland. You know Switzerland pretty well. Um, <clears throat> and I sent it to him, he read it, and he said, there's not enough here, but it's too narrow focused to really develop into a large novel. But the battle scene and the, the, the warfare that's in the novel and in the story makes me realize that we really haven't focus chiefly on the military side of the series. You know, we've had battles in previous volumes. We've had armies on the march and, you know, active in, in previous no, uh, volumes, but we've never had a novel that chiefly focuses on the military side. Mm -hmm. So um, I think Eric had from, from that reading uh, a good notion that this is exactly what he wanted to do in this novel. So we knew from the early, early on that battles and the preparations for the battles were going to be a significant portion of this novel, a significant factor. Well, that's, and that's part of the series too. The 1632 series is all the knock-on effects of not only the technology, but the theory behind the technology. So like exactly. marching up in pikes, uh, you know, which is the standard tactic for the era, uh, marching up in hedgehogs uh, of pikes and everything else like that is just not done anymore, uh, or it could be, but not if you're facing modern 1630x uh, uh, armaments and stuff. So yeah, it's it. Uh, that's one of the interesting things about how Eric kind of went with with stuff was he he was very much always kind of interested in the politics, uh, and that's one of the things that goes into. A, a, deeper into the uh, this novel is the for me was the uh, discussion of all of the different groups we'll get that in a, in a minute but all of the different diverse um, political blocks that were trying to secure power or protect themselves uh, in this uh, in Transylvania and in, in the region so it's uh, quite impressive so I guess you didn't stumble on it uh, and you didn't really work your way to it but uh, the care and the characters probably didn't dictate it either. But uh, you have this uh, flank of the war between the USC and its allies and uh, uh, the Ottoman nation. Um, so did you have fun with that? Were you able to kind of uh, pick up some characters that you would, were interested in uh, running with? Oh, from that side of the at that side of the conflict? Yeah, there were three characters specifically that I, I really, I wanted once I um, read through uh, the Ottoman onslaught and the uh, um, Polish maelstrom that I wanted to bring into this into this novel, and I asked Eric to make sure that it was okay for us to use these characters. One of them was Usan Hussein. He's a man that shows up pretty prominently in the uh, um, in the uh, Ottoman onslaught. Uh, but he sort of is sort of demoted because of decisions, bad decisions that he makes. He makes bad military decisions that pisses off Murad, you know, and he's basically confined to just basically <clears throat> working uh, as a sort of a guard, I guess, in, in, in Vienna, I guess. Is, is yeah. it? And um, that's one character that I really liked and I really wanted to see him back in the action. 
Duncan. So I asked Derek if we could bring him back in. And also there are two other characters. They're two Jewish characters. They're what they called back in those days, kafirs or zimis. They were um, sort of uh, citizens of the Ottoman Empire. Um, there were two of them. There's uh, Moje, uh, Moze uh, Mizrahi and uh, Mordecai Passach, who are uh, the two um, crewmen of an Ottoman airship called the Calderon. Um, I love those guys. I just, I just, I just think they're just fantastic, you know. And so I asked them if we could bring them in too, because, uh, it, and it, and it was, and it felt natural and it felt right to do that because one of the characters in 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 the conflict in, in Transylvanian decision is a fellow named Vasily Lupu, which is the voivode, of the uh, prince basically of Moldavia. And he was just dying to get an airship, you know. He just really, really wanted one to be able to function. So, when, when that and his desire to get one really came to light, I thought we need to get the Calder and we need to get these two uh, guys back into the battle. So I was, I was very glad to to have that kind of connection, you know, with the, with with the with the Ottoman side of the conflict. Very cool. So, uh, which character in 1637, the Transylvanian decision, surprised you? I thought about that, and I and I think that the um, the the one that surprised me the most is Denise Beasley. Eric wanted her in the novel, um, you know, pretty much at the beginning. He gave me a list of the characters that he wanted to. There was a number of characters that he wanted to bring back into the series that hadn't been in the series for quite a while. Uh, Jason Gotkin, um, Len Tanner, Ellie Anderson. Uh, those were three, uh, to name a few, that he wanted to bring back into the series that he hadn't been brought in for. And then in, and in that list, he also listed Denise Beasley. Now, he wanted Denise to be a pilot. He wanted her to be a member of the, um, the small but burgeoning um, <clears throat> uh, Bohemian Air Force. And he wanted her to fly in a small reconnaissance aircraft, which what they call the Dvorak's down time. They're basically modeled after an uptime um, Hawk Aero 2 I think is what they're called. They're, they're, they're an ultralight, um, you know, they're kind of a rickety ultralight little plane that can uh, right. land pretty much anywhere as long as you've got and a, a pusher bit, prop too, right? A pusher prop plane, yeah. They, the propellers behind the, um, the, behind the, uh, <clears throat> behind the, the wing. And um, so he wanted her to come in and, and, and pilot one of those as a reconnaissance pilot. And I didn't really know what beyond that she would what role she would play and I thought maybe Eric might write that character you know like he wrote the Gretchen Riker uh, sections in the novel but he, he basically kind of turned her over to me and I started writing her and I really enjoyed writing those sections a lot more than I expected especially once she got into the field and she started to really do her reconnaissance work um, mm -hmm. relationships that she, she she has with some of the uh, cavalry officers and second cavalry regiment and I'm not talking um uh, romantic relationships they're just friends you know because because they they experience they have some tough experiences together that they they've had to work through um <clears throat> all of that combined and then when her partner comes in the thing tuva drazel another one of the pilots comes into uh, to to the uh, to the action um she just was great I, I really enjoyed her and i was quite surprised at how much i would enjoy writing that character well, and as an uptimer too, she gives you a good uh, access to changing the 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 kind of or observing the norms of behavior from everybody else, uh, and kind of going, well, that's that's different. So yeah, yeah, yeah. she is a fun character, and I I enjoyed her particular uh, the name of her her uh, plane, etc. was uh, was quite fun too. Yeah, the Dixie Chick. Yeah, uh, and so uh, how did she come to be? As far, aside from him providing her for you he, he had uh, uh eric providing her for you uh had he used her as a pilot in the previous books or uh well that's a question i'm not sure offhand exactly whether she was used as a pilot or not but i know that she did appear in other novels and other and other stories she may very well have been part of that i know that she is she is sort of loosely betrothed to eddie yunker Eddie Yunker is a pilot and Eddie Yunker had been used as a pilot previously. So I'm sure that she had, even if she wasn't extensively used as a pilot in the okay. past, right. she knew a piloting and, 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 and she had a perfect access to people who could help her become a good pilot on this, on this aircraft. And she loves it. And it's called the Dvorak, the, the little pusher plane that she flies. The official term of it is called the Dvorak. And she loves, she loves piloting the plane. 
Cool. So uh, in a similar vein, uh, which character from 1637, the Transylvanian decision, would you want to avoid like the plague and why? <laughs> well, there's actually three, but the, the, the two that, that I would, I'm going to give you two. There, there's two that I would avoid uh, like the plague, and that is um, the Voivode of Moldavia, the uh, Vasily Lupu, and um, his, his sort of uh, terrorist thug, Sergiu Botnari. Those are, those are two characters that I, I really enjoyed writing, and they were necessary in the novel. <clears throat> but, but, you know, Sergiu is a thug. He is, he, is, he is the leader of a terrorist organization that sort of functions in Transylvania during the, the novel called the Impalers. And their job is to sort of just disrupt. You know, their, their job is to go around, disrupt, try to discourage Transylvanians from assisting, you know, Morris Roth and his Grand Army in the Sunrise. And so he, he is just a thug. He's competent. He's a good shoot, shot, but he's just a, a thug. And so I would not want to share a beer and, and chat with that man. And maybe even more so Vasily Lupu. Now, historically, what's interesting about uh, Vasily is that <clears throat> he suffered from delusions of grandeur. He, was, he, he believed that he was the reincarnation of a Byzantine emperor and that he was going to bring the Byzantine empire back to fruition. Um, so he, he, he's, he's sort of a dingbat from the beginning, he, he, but he was a lot of fun. But he was one of the richest um, persons in Eastern Europe at the time. He had a lot of wealth, uh, which is one of the reasons why he could, you know, pour, fork out money to, uh, to um, um, uh, Murad IV and get, you know, his own personal airship. And so he's, he's, he's childish, he's petulant, he's, he's a risk taker, he, he's he, not calculated risk either, he takes a lot of, he's very dangerous, he's very risk taking. So I don't think I'd like to be around him either. So those would be the two that I would say, God, avoid these guys like the plague, but they were blast, they were a lot of fun to write about. <clears throat> so which character would you want as an ally? Mm. Well, it'd be hard not to say Isaac, but uh, Isaac Cohen, which we'll talk about, I imagine, a little later on. <clears throat> but I would have to say that for me personally, <clears throat> of the characters uh, that were in there, I would have to say that probably Christian Von Jory. Captain Von Jory, he's a, he's a, a mercenary captain. Uh, he's a cavalry, ca cavalry officer from um, Switzerland. He comes from Zurich. His family, the Von Jories, were are basically horse people. They they had stables and liveries and and you know they had uh, all different kinds of and, and blacksmith shops. They were they were sort of like well known in in Zurich as 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 uh, horse uh, horse merchants. <clears throat> so he lived and served all you know he lived pretty much all his life around horses. But he's the kind of guy. <clears throat> That, you know, in a pinch, he's the one that, you know, will, will go in, he'll, he'll you know, I, I think he'll fight for him. He's a good man. He's got good ethics, good morals. And I just, I just, if, if I had a guy that I needed by my side, who will take a bullet, uh, you know, for you, I really think that Christian Jory, Yvonne Jory would, would do that. I think he would be probably the best of that. So, cool. so uh 1637, the Transylvania decision impressed me with its scope and the size of its multicultural cast. I had little idea of just how many different cultural and religious influences were at work in Transylvania. About how many religions were in play there? Oh, wow. <laughs> or sects, I guess, maybe. Yeah, maybe religious sects, or, religious yeah. groups. Um, well, this is a question that, you know, honestly, I wish Eric were here because I think Eric would provide a much more co cogent and complete description of those things. I know he spent time himself researching the diversity, the cultural diversity and the religious diversity of the area. <clears throat> we deal with five, five specific um, religious sects in the novel. We, we deal with them in some capacity or another. I won't tell you how much, but basically, um, okay, so there are Unitarians, which are, um, you know, a Christian group, pretty, pretty sizable, <clears throat> pretty large number of uh, Unitarians that exist in Transylvania at the time. There are Catholics, there are Calvinists, and in fact, the princess consort, uh, Lady Lauranfi, the, uh, the wife of uh, George Rakotsi, um, she's a Calvinist. 
and and there was Jews too. There was quite a quite a number of Jews. There was a number of communities um, in Transylvania at the time that were, of course, Jewish communities. Now they were not spread all over the, the country, but they're but and so they were sort of like isolated in various areas. But there was a number of them. There was actually quite a healthy uh, a number of Jewish uh, communities in Transylvania at the time. <clears throat> so those are like the four major religions and sects that were in the. Uh, uh, country at the time, but and but there was one other, and that is that we that we deal with was the Sabbatarians. Now the Sabbatarians were sort of a small religious sect. Um, basically, what they were is they were Christians with Judaizing beliefs. In other words, they were sort of both. They 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 practiced Christian. They had Christian beliefs and faith and practices, and they also uh, followed a lot of the um, Jewish. You know. Um, practices and beliefs too. They sort of straddled the fence between the, the two different. Um, Which I'm sure was just great for them as far as getting getting it from both sides as far as uh, having discrimination put leveled, leveled against them. <clears throat> yeah. The, it, 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 the, Transylvania was pr a pretty diverse uh, culturally and religiously, but uh, this was one blemish, I think, on their history. And that is during this, actually during this historical time period around 1635, 1636, 37, they, they, the Sabbatarians were actually persecuted. Um, there, they were, they were seized. Some of them were put in, in prison. Uh, their property was taken. They were, um, <clears throat> they were put on trial. They were basically given the ultimatum either, you know, I guess pick one or the other, you know, you're either a Jew or you're a Gentile, um, pick one or the other, but you can't be both. And this was a sentiment that I think kind of permeated through the, the, the power structure in Transylvania. I know that the prince himself, Prince George of Kutsi, <clears throat> um, was not very happy with um, that religion and that sect. So, and so you um, said his wife was, uh, was a Calvinist. Was he a Calvinist or? No, I believe if memory serves, and I could be wrong, I apologize if I'm wrong. I think he was Unitarian. I do believe so. I think he was. I don't right think right there, right from the head, <laughs> from the head on down, you've you've got that. And the era had such a uh, a hang up about, you know, as the prince, so the people, uh, you know, being the same religion. Um, so that's pretty fascinating in and of itself that they Yeah, that yeah, era, I mean yeah, and and so you know what they what 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 happened to the Sabbatarians, of course, is 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 a tragedy, um, <clears throat> and it's a blemish in an otherwise pretty good culturally and, and religiously diverse uh, culture. Um, but of course, with Morris Roth in town and the Grand Army of the Sunrise, th this is not going to happen. The, the persecution is not going to happen, and so that's that is one of the good things with Morris's arrival in uh, in Transylvania. Well, and also one of the neatest things about. 1632 in general. Absolutely. You know, you do it better, right? Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the ring of fire questions. and the people that came through it give yeah. the world more options to live by. Yeah. So, uh, and so we've talked about the religious groups. There's also e almost an equal or greater number of mm -hmm. cultural and language groups that are also mm -hmm. uh, in Transylvania and in the region. Yeah. Now, Eric and I don't address all of them, but um, the two that we that we focus on the most are um, the um, German population in Transylvania, which at the time were called Saxons. They called them Saxons, <clears throat> but there was a very large German population, and they lived primarily in the southern region of Transylvania. They lived in what they called Saxon seas, you know, uh, uh, counties along the, the Wallachian border of, of southern Transylvania. They're significant. They're a significant cultural group in Transylvania. And uh, their, their main, one of their largest cities, Hermannstadt, is featured in the novel. <clears throat> the other group that we deal with as well is the, uh, what they call the Seklers, the Sekelis, the Seklers. Um, they, they are basically Hungarian, but they have lived long enough in Transylvania that um, they sort of kind of created their own sort of cultural entity and existence, but they are, they are basically descended from Hungarians. <clears throat> and then on that, sorry, and then on the Western side, which is partially in uh, um, Hungary, as I understand it, and maybe also part in, in Transylvania as well is the so-called Partium region. They have what they call high ducks or hajdus, which are um, basically um, <clears throat> um, 
what are they called? They're, they're basically, uh, they're, they're, they're Hungarians, but they live in that area and they're in the mountainous region or mountainous areas. They're the shepherds and, and they're a really strong, have a really strong warlike culture. The Hajdu mercenaries that come out of there that, that are used by the Transylvanians are, are tough. They're really tough men and tough, tough soldiers. So those are the three that we think on, but I suspect that, yeah, there's others as well. Um, you know, there, I'm sure there's Polish, there's Slovaks, there are, and I would imagine because of their connections with the Wallachians and also with uh, the Ottoman Empire, that there were probably also even, maybe even Arabic Arabic people within Transylvania. Or Turkish. Turkish yeah. Absolutely, Turkish yeah. people within Transylvania. Hmm. Yes. Absolutely. So uh, it sounds like you and Eric uh, did a lot of research. Uh, you have any uh, idea of how many hours of, uh, of you spent uh, in researching this before you set, set pen to paper? <clears throat> Well, I'm happy to say that Eric spent some time researching this as well. So I, I didn't have to take the over part of this. I mean, we, we shared the we shared the effort on this one. I, I, you know, I read, I have stacks of papers. I've read the history of Moldavia, the history of Wallachia, the history of Transylvania. There were some really good articles published in the Granville Gazette about the Transylvania and that area of the, of the world. And so I read through those. They were really good. Um, I... Uh, I spent a lot of time reading about the Transylvanian diet. I spent I, the diet or diet. I spent a lot of time uh, talking about um, <clears throat> working on the Hajdu and the uh, and, and the mercenaries along the party. And so yes, 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 uh, uh, and the military aspects of all those too, because I had to create armies that were uh, that were uh, that would exactly. come into the yeah that would come into the novel you know at 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 their proper time. And so yeah, I spent a lot of time doing that. Eric spent a lot of time, some time working on the religious side of it and the cultural side of it, giving some input and information about that as well. So yeah, we spent a lot of time on that. So one of the primary characters uh, is a downtime doctor, Isaac Cohen, who you mentioned uh, earlier. He works through a lot of battlefield and rehabilitation medicine. Um, I presume from how well it's presented that there was a lot of research there. Uh, did you speak to a surgeon or a nurse to get the details right? Um, no, actually, I didn't speak to a nurse or a surgeon um, specifically about this project. <clears throat> but as I mentioned earlier, I've been in the gaming industry for 28 years. For the past 22 years, I've worked for a company called Breakaway Games. What Breakaway Games does primarily is games, we design and develop games that are so-called serious games. They are games that are used as training tools for various professionals. And most of the games that we design are medical games, games set in the medical field. I mean, we've done games on triage practices. We've done games on emergency room uh, practices and procedures. We've done games on the interview process between doctors and nurses and patients. <clears throat> we've done mass casualty event games. And uh, uh, certainly the casualties that come out of the, the battles that are in the novel could absolutely be defined as mass casualty events. Yeah. <laughs> and so um and we've even done games about uh, dental implant training which is not fun to watch those videos um so i brought <clears throat> this i brought some knowledge of all of that to the table from the very beginning and so um and in the process of working on all those games i did i i talked to nurses and doctors and other professional medical professionals and techs we needed to in order to get the subject matter material that we need in order to do that. So I, I, I did have some working knowledge coming into it about some of this stuff. Um, I also watched a lot of video. I watched a lot of video of how gunshot wounds, particularly the kinds of guns that they might have, you know, uh, flintlock and matchlock and, and percussion cap, <clears throat> the kind of impact that they, the gunshot wounds to the body would have. You know, because, you know, because Isaac Cohen is dealing with those kinds of wounds all the time in the novel. Amputations. Uh, the modern, uh, modern equivalent basically is the deer slug, right? Exactly. Exactly. And so and, and also amputations. You know, I watched a lot about how they did amputations during the Civil War. So um, I watched a lot of videos about those. Um, and um, I also talked to uh, uh, Virginia DeMars, you know, one of the ladies that are, you know, very important in the novel and in the series, rather. She's been a significant part of the series for a very long time. She gave me some information and some 
um, data about downtime poultices, you know, basically salves um, that, that Isaac, because there's one, there's a scene in the novel where <clears throat> when they arrive in Casa, one of the, one of the places that they go, a lot of the so-called Joshua Corps, which is the basically the collective units, all the, the all the Jewish soldiers that are in the Grand Army at Sunrise, have been collected under what they call the Joshua Corps. Right. And a lot of these men are young, they're inexperienced, they haven't been on the march, they don't understand the rigors of the march, and their feet are just, you know, dying with blisters and and lesions and just all kinds of problems and and so she was able to provide me some information about some salves that they could use downtime that could that could give them some relief and comfort on it <clears throat> so all of that combined um, um, helped me um, write all of the uh, medical uh, portions of the uh, novel so again, it was another big, massive pile of research. But again, as I said, I, I also brought quite a bit of knowledge to the table from the very beginning. So, cool. So uh, the Transylvanian decision follows Morris Roth's Anaconda project, which is the uptimer's attempt to ensure that Shumiki pogrom and other anti-Semitic horrors of the 17th and later centuries never occur. Can you tell us some more about this project and perhaps a bit about the historical events that inspired the writing of this without getting into too many spoilers? Yes, absolutely. And I want to say for my part, um, I want to apologize to all the Hungarians and the Romanians out there who are hearing it, hearing me, and I'm going to butcher some of these pronunciations, so I apologize in advance. Um, the Camille Nitschke or the Camille Nicky pogrom, <clears throat> it's basically a, a peasant uprising and a Cossack uprising that occurred during um, the Polish Cossack Wars of 1648 to 1658. So in the history that the, you know, the uptimers have fallen into the, the timeline, it, it hasn't officially happened yet. But Morris Roth ain't taking no chances, you right. know, as a, as a Jewish man himself. And as a man who understands the history of the, the, the terrible atrocities that have been committed against the Jewish citizens and the Jewish populations through time, he's not going to take any chances that this Jamil Nicky pogrom or Camille Nicky pogrom is not going to occur simply because the Ring of Fire happened, you know, and the Ring of Fire has changed history to, in such an, uh, an extent that it, it wouldn't happen anyway. He, he doesn't buy it. <clears throat> so um, another, this is another question that, I, I wish Eric were here to answer because Eric started um, um, the his Anaconda project and his 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 desire um, Morris Ross desire to do this. I think back into the um, the first novella he wrote where Morris Roth was a main character, the Wallenstein Gambit, which I think was in the first anthology. I think it was in a Ring of Fire one anthology, where he wanted to find a way to to. Um, eliminate to prevent this pogrom from occurring and he continued um, um, Morris's desire to see this end in 1637 the Polish maelstrom right. which is when we first saw the Grand Army of the Sunrise in action and it continues now in the Transylvanian decision um, it's not finished we're not done yet um, but uh, he's moving on. He's working on it. He's working on it. And he's got support. He's got the support of the Bohemians. He's got the support of the USE. Right. So, um, you know, he's, he's, he's working toward that, that goal. Ultimately, his goal is to ensure that the systems that are in place, it's not just somebody wakes up one day and says, oh, we're going to do this. <clears throat> he feels that there are systems in place. There's cultural, religious, and um, political systems that were in place that created this pogrom to her. And he's not convinced that the Ring of Fire, because it existed or because it occurred, is going to eliminate these systems. He right. wants to make sure that they're eliminated. <clears throat> to oh, sure. and, and was, what little I read about the, the that particular pogrom was, was kind of odd to my thinking as well, because the uprising, he, he almost, the, the person who perpetrated the uprising, uh, pretty much leveraged uh, hatred and anti-Semitic uh, behaviors as a way to gain power over it, uh, amongst the other peasants in order to overthrow uh, the, the powers that be, which to me seems uh, uh, seems kind of odd. I, I didn't it didn't kind of compute for me. So I was I was fascinated by 
just scratching the surface on that re on reading of that. So I'm going to have to delve into it more. I'm considering having a T-shirt made. You know, that I, I've seen it for uh, the Total War game. Everything I know about the 17th century, I learned from Eric Flint's, Flint's Ring of Fire. Yeah, good, oh, good man. Yeah, I, I order that, one. You do it. I'll order one. That'd be all great. Right, yeah, so I'll, maybe I'll work that out. But it, it it seemed to me that like you know, there's so many things that so many aspects of our history that can come to light and can be re-examined or examined by, just by even mentioning them in this uh, alternate history uh, exactly. stuff. It certainly spurred my interest in, in trying to figure it out because I, I know next to nothing about uh, Transylvania uh, and the region. Um, so not to give anything away, but 1637, we've already touched on this a bit. Uh, the Transylvanian decision has a huge sprawling battle involving multiple army corps in conflict. I know you're an avid gamer like me. Uh, did you game out some of the battle sequence or map them out on a tabletop or? <laughs> well, uh, yes, in a way I did. Um, <clears throat> in my day job, I use a program called Vizio. Visio is a, a tool that, you know, <clears throat> you can create all kinds of documents, diagrams. I suspect that architects might use it. Um, various people use it. You can bring in graphics and images and the text, your ability to um, manipulate text and, you know, do everything is, is almost, as, it, almost as good as Word, Microsoft Word. <clears throat> so you can create all kinds of documents and, and diagrams and everything in this program. And uh, program and, and you can do multiple, multiple pages and pages and pages. It's sort of set up and allows you to do this like a, uh, like, like, a, um, uh, like a spreadsheet. <clears throat> I use this, I use this program in my day job to create um, user manuals, uh, quick start guides, any kind of documentation that we need for the games that we design and we produce. <clears throat> And it's extremely helpful on there because it's colorful and, you know, you can bring this in all kinds of different shapes and images and arrows and manipulate text in a lot of very good ways. <clears throat> so what I did was, is I downloaded some um, satellite imagery of the areas where the battles were going to take place. <clears throat> I put them in the program and then I went back up online and I got a lot of military symbology. You know, I got symbols for infantry and cavalry and, and tanks and <clears throat> box, the box with a slash through it, the box. With yeah, the, yeah, the box with a slash through it is infantry, the, the X as the as, as well, the, the X is the infantry, the slash is the cavalry, oh, yeah. armor units, a cannon, artillery, even air force, because, you know, the there's a small air force in, 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 in action and in, in present in the novel. <clears throat> I laid all those out on the map, you know, to sort of set up where all the units were going to start the battles. Because if, if, if I was going to have to try to write these scenes, and, and especially the last battle scene, battle, which is massive, I, it would have been chaos. I, I just would not have been able to visualize how things were going to go down unless I actually had a visual sense on where the armies were going to start, you know. <clears throat> so I, I, I worked through both both major battles in, in the novel that way. Um, and once I laid it all out, you know, this is what happens. This is where the armies start. This is how they move. This is what happens after day one or after the first hour or the second hour. Once I got that done, I created a PDF. You can create PDF files. And then I sent it to Eric and I had Eric look it over and um, he would give me feedback. And so once I once he I got his feedback and made any adjustments he wanted me to make, I went ahead and wrote wrote the wrote the parts. But if I hadn't done that, like you say, if I hadn't actually played it out, you yeah. know, I didn't do it on a tabletop, but I more or less played it out. Yeah, no, I mean, that, it sounds like the only thing you didn't do was roll dice. <laughs> the only thing I didn't do was roll dice, man. I'm telling you, and. And sometimes I wish I had dice because yeah. I had a decision. I said, let me just see if I, you know, if I could roll a die and whatever it says. Right. Um, but no, it, it certainly played out in the reading of it because it's coherent. And but there's, but there's also that question of what's going on uh, because communications being what they were, nobody knew exactly what was going on. And, and also the duration of the battle, like the, the it takes a long time to move, you know, 10 men, let alone a thousand or, 
tens of thousands, you know. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. You know, in the in the final battle, you know, there's a move of the Janissaries. You know, the Ottomans had sent some some troops, and there's a move for the of the Janissaries, which is a major part of the battle down there. Um, it takes a long time, and um, Matei Basarab, who is the voivode of Wallachia, <clears throat> um, he. Uh, he doesn't know what the hell's going on in the center, you know, because, it, you know, he hasn't heard word. He hasn't had communications at all. And he's sweating bullets trying to figure out what the hell's going on. And that's true. That's absolutely true. I mean, because, uh, you know, th that side of the equation didn't have radios. You know, they had they had to carry messages via horse, you know, horse carrier courier. So it was difficult to find. And sometimes those couriers don't show up, you know, or. You know, so it was a much more difficult. The, 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 the other side, you know, the, the Grand Army of Sunrise had a much better time of communications, <clears throat> which is one of the things that, you know, it, you know, that the series itself shows that, you know, uptime technologies like radio can really make a stark difference in how battles are played out. Well, and that's part of the, the, the whole setup for the battle is also the frustration of uh, the geography of the area and how it impacts communication, uh, either of the old sort or the new, uh, with uh, with radio. So that yeah, you you seem to have covered all angles with that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean uh, Ellie Anderson, which is one of the characters, and she's one of the the key uh, radio persons in there with her husband Len. She gets so frustrated because the, trans the Carpathian Mountains are are playing hell with her damn communications, and so they have that's, to. That's putting to it mildly. She puts it a lot less mildly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost every other word coming out of her mouth is a curse word of some kind. Yeah, yeah, an f bomb. Yeah, she's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she's. I, I she's kind of at work. I tell you. Yeah, so no, and it's funny because that that was something I discussed with Eric when I was working on uh, the uh, mission to the Mughals. Was I had a character who's kind of his tag was to say everything well shit, <laughs> you know. He would always drop an, uh, the s bomb in there at some point. <laughs> And that was kind of one of my tags for him. Was so I'm letting the reader know, hey, I don't have to say John said. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> if I, yeah, no, if I, no. You know, preface it with this. And he's like, well, you know, we just need to have a few less, you know, Kurt, we don't need to have that many. It's just use it one or two times. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. So yeah, I guess no, he, no. He, he got a little less sensitive to that. <laughs> I think he did because, uh, you know, in our process, um, when I sent him back the things, whatever Ellie said, I don't recall him making any changes he certainly didn't change any of the f words that i recall that i used no. in there um, well, I, I think also for him it was just kind of neat to have this this uptime gal just you know tearing it up so like yeah buck all the rules yeah and, and her whole job it. her whole job is to communicate she's communicating the way she wants to communicate she's communicating you're absolutely right she's communicating in the way that she wants to and she needs to in order to, to and, and everybody around her needs to adapt to that because she's the the expert i, I think that was uh, well done and it's also you know kind of uh, I don't want to say feminist but it is in a way you know it's like hey that's kind of one of the ways that Eric kind of uh, uh, dug in on folks was to it kind of secretly slid some stuff into them that they weren't necessarily looking for is, is you know, hey this is uh, strong, uh, intelligent uh, women doing the right thing uh, you know despite circumstances that you know today would be just a horror show if any any of the misogyny oh, absolutely. we have now was to go on or uh, we have then was to go on now we would just lose our minds oh absolutely yeah and, no, and yet right. these women just seem to excel and and they navigate this world uh not without loss or difficulty but oh with sure own, with their no, own skills you know, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. And, and, and Denise Beasley is the same way. I mean, she doesn't cuss nowhere near as much, of course, as Ellie Anderson does, but <clears throat> she's, she's, a, she's, a, she's, a, she's very uh, outspoken and, and she's got like almost infinite energy and, uh, you know, she lays it on the line and she tells you what she thinks. I mean, she gives Jeff Higgins an earful earlier on in the novels of, of, of some discussions about her aircraft and, so, you know, um, I, I agree with you. I think that's exactly what Eric wanted to show. And I think it's a good way to show it, too, because I think it, there's shock value in it from the people that are downtime that are suddenly uh, immersed in this kind of behavior. But it, it also um, helps to uh, eventually lessen the blow that, hey, the world's changed. And whether you like it or not, the world's going to change. You know, women are not going to be treated the way they are. Yeah, they have been in the past, you know, things are going to change and it's a way to, to showcase that change. 
Well, and then also that you, the, you mentioned the princess earlier. Uh, she's also unwilling to change her circumstances. Like, uh, no, you're not going to do that. Uh, so there isn't, it's mm-hmm. not like it's all everybody immediately starts singing Kumbaya, let's do it this way. <laughs> oh, absolutely. There's yeah. a lot no, of resistance too. Yeah. No, there is a lot of resistance. And uh, she's, she, you know, historically, uh, Laurent Fee was very, very religious. She's a very relatively pious, religious person. So it, it's hard to move someone like that. You know, um, she's going to she's going to stick to her guns and stick to her belief system. And it's going to be very difficult to change it. But she's a good she's an interesting woman, too. I, I really I really liked writing her. Too. Oh, and that's, that's again part of that that full circle. <laughs> like everybody has their own position some of which is never going to move, some of which will move, that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. I think it's it makes it for a well-rounded, almost as if we're reading a history rather than an alternate history. So yeah. I, I very much appreciated that about uh, about Transylvanian decision. Uh, so it, it also deals a lot with what happens when two armies with modern, <clears throat> the 1632 universe armaments, meet on the battlefield. And more than <laughs> any book in this series that I've read, it also deals with the physical aftermath of combat with all its pains. Uh, was this battle after the battle, as it were, something that occurred to you as you worked on the book or something you wanted to approach for a while? Well, when Eric and I decided that this novel was going to focus chiefly on the uh, military side of the series, I mean, I knew right then and there that, um, you know, we were going to have to deal with the after effects of battle. Well, we, you know, <clears throat> in my opinion, you know, and, and, I've, and I've tried to display this in other things that I've written in the series, I think it's dishonest not to show the horrors of war. You know, I think it's dishonest to the reader. I mean, a lot of people don't like to see that kind of pain and suffering and the things. They, they don't enjoy it. But, you know, if you're going to have battle scenes, you're going to have war, you're going to have suffering, you're going to have loss, you're going to have good people die just as much as the bad people die. And there's no reason to sugarcoat it. Um, you know, I, I try not to be overly graphic and gratuitous. There's no, there's no purpose, there's no purpose served in being overly gratuitous. But um, I, I think it's, I think it's dishonest to not uh, show battle and war in its, in its total arc. You know, it's, it's total, right. total presence. So I knew that when the battles came, I was going to show that kind of suffering and that kind of loss at the end after the aftermath. And having Isaac Cohen. Of course, as one of the main uh, characters in the, in the novel, a junior surgeon, who's um, it, this is really uh, with the exception of some work that he did at the Battle of the Bridge in Wallenstein's Gambit. This is his really first time that he's actually been in the the, the serious midst of that kind of suffering and, and 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 death, and it gets to him at one part in the novel. You know, <clears throat> he he has to overcome it. He's he's got to. He's got to, you know, deal with his, his the trauma of having to deal with that. And I and I thought that having a character in there like that, and I was actually, it was Eric who said he wanted to have a surgeon in this novel, you know. So I, I came up with Isaac Cohen and I was I was glad he did because it did give me an avenue through which we could show that, you know, they always call, you know, sir, uh, you know, people in the tent, they call the tent, they're in the tent, you know, they're in the medical field, they're in the medical tent. And so it was a way to, to showcase the whole, the whole aspects of, of the battle. So, yeah, it was something that I, I, I've all, I always want to show when I'm showing battles. Well, you know, one, of the, one of the things with, uh, you know, that occurred to me reading it was, is that finally we get back to, you know, the, 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 there was kind of a, a tongue-in-cheek jo- joke in Star Trek about calling the Dr. Bones. Because it wasn't because he had any name that was relevant to Bones. It was because they were cutting down Bone Saw. And, you know, the, literally the reason why the doctors were called or nicknamed, you know, <laughs> Bone Saw was because they were cutting people's limbs off uh in the exactly. aftermath of the civil war and world war one etc so exactly and um i think it does a disservice to the uh, to the entirety of the story if you just leave that stuff alone and say oh there's a big battle people die let's move on nah. right. you know I'm, i wasn't gonna do that yeah when i also enjoyed the, <laughs> the byplay between the the politics of the of service as the surgeons between the uh, elder, the primary surgeon of the Army of the Sunrise, 
the nursing staff and this junior yet uh, well-respected and uh, for his leadership quality as much as for his medical ability, uh, Isaac Cohen. So there's that really, it, it, it formed a major subplot that I really enjoyed of the book. Plus you add in uh, Isaac's religion uh, and his reasons for taking service with the Army of the Sunrise. And you really get uh, a, a, a stronger feel in those moments when the, uh, the Joshua Corps goes into battle and things aren't going well that this is going to be tough on Isaac, uh, you know, down the road, because his battle literally starts like an hour or so after the battle. Starts. Absolutely. When, it when, doesn't when, end for months after the battle, because <laughs> that was one of the things I loved about that, how you introduced those characters was Isaac and uh, Christian meet because Christian is a patient of Isaac's and, uh, and go through the rehab, all that stuff. And having gone through back surgery and, you know, injuries on the job, being, you know, the, the rehab is is really where it's at. I mean, the surgeon can be as good as they can be, but if you're lazy and don't do anything, you're not going to uh, reap the full benefits of whatever the surgeon's knife did for you. I, I'm really glad you defined it that way because that that's exactly right. The <clears throat> Isaac's battle doesn't begin until hour two hours after it starts. Once the casualties start rolling in. <clears throat> He's in the midst of the war. He's in the midst of the battle. And you're right. There, there is a there is a cutoff point when the battle, when the guns stop firing, the cannons stop firing, and the bombs uh, from you know stop dropping. You know, <clears throat> he 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 has to deal with the horror of it of the after effect for weeks, months afterwards. And as I said, there is this you know there's a there's a time in the in the novel where it gets to him. You know, it, it, it <laughs> and he and he has a, a pretty serious discussion with uh, um, uh, um, General von Mercy about it. Yep. And um, yeah, and and so uh, that that's a really good perspective to put it in that way. And uh, seeing other people too, like um, Carl Oberhauser, who is the chief medical officer of the Rise of the Sunrise, how much he cusses and, and rants and raves. And uh, Isaac's pretty much convinced that the reason why he's such an SOB is because he, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. It's the only way that that guy, you know, from his perspective, can get through the suffering. You know, he just is, is just harsh and he's mean and he's grumpy and he does it. But um, after it all, you know, he can he, he can serve the the, uh, the 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 Grand Army of the Sunrise as a chief medical officer if he does that sort of thing. So I agree with you. I think that's a, a fantastic description. And I, I wonder if, you know, Eric's uh, last couple of years informed his opinion on on surgeons and wanting to include one in one of his novels because uh, <clears throat> he had the cancer stuff and he was surrounded by medical staff. He had some heart difficulties and uh, just uh I wonder if that didn't inform his decision to, hey, I want to put a surgeon in this book. It wouldn't it wouldn't doubt me in the least. I mean, he, he never specifically stated that, but it wouldn't surprise me in the least that he has because, you know, like you say, in the last few years, he's had to rely a lot on medical on medical personnel, you know, to 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 survive and stay alive. And so I agree with you. I think he, he very much may have um, wanted that to see that in this novel because of that very reason. All right. Well, penultimate question. What aside from its considerable raw <laughs> by do you hope readers will carry with them after reading 1637, the Transylvanian decision? Well, I guess in a, in a, in a, in a, in a overall view of the thing, I, I, I want people to remember that there are causes worth fighting for. You know, there are, there are, there are causes even maybe worth dying for. And Morris Roth is continuing his Anaconda project. He's continuing moving east into the Ruthenian lands. He will get there eventually, I hope, to, to make sure that the Chimil and Nikki pogrom does not occur. This, this, this Transylvanian novel is one part of the larger, um, his larger cause and his larger uh, plan. And I, I, I hope people get out of this novel that there are, um, um, there are, there's things worth fighting for and to eliminate that atrocity against um, the Jewish communities in Eastern Europe is absolutely worth fighting for. That's, that's, that's what I hope that they get out of this novel. 
No big deal. Um, so last question, uh, what conventions can your fans hope to catch up with you? And uh, what other work do you have in the pipeline for your fans to read? Well, the the convention, uh, I'm going to PhilCon. The, Sci the Philadelphia Science Fiction uh, Society has their annual convention in, in Philadelphia. Actually, it's technically in New Jersey, but it's just right over the border. So it's 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 very close. It's PhilCon. That's <clears throat> that's in that's the weekend uh, right before Thanksgiving. I will be there for the whole weekend. Um, don't have my schedule yet, so I'm not exactly sure what I'll be doing. I hope that they'll allow me to read, because if they put me on as a reading, I will be reading from Transylvanian Decision. So if anyone's there who wants to uh, re have me read some of it, I will be reading from that novel if they give me a reading slot. So that's the that's the one convention that I'm going to. Um, I may drop into ChessyCon, which is a con convention, I think, either an early um um, November, I believe. I, I haven't I haven't looked into it in the things. So I, I might drop in there for uh, for a little while. I don't know. As far as work that I'm doing, other other writing tasks and other uh, other projects. Um, <clears throat> and you know this one. Uh, 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 Griffin and I are working on a project with Steve Jackson. Um, we're writing a supplement uh, for his GURPS uh, role playing system, his generic universal role playing system, GURPS. Um, the 1632 GURPS, we're, we're, we're writing a supplement that will uh, encompass the entirety of the series into and boil it down into a role-playing supplement that can be used by the people who play GURPS. And uh, that's fun. I'm, I'm having really a good time. Uh, it's, it's another research heavy project, you know, just, and you know it as well as I do. Um, no, and it, it's, it's also been fun given that, you know, thinking about things in different terms than we normally do. So absolutely like in, in, in absolutely giving... you, know, you got to look at it in sort of like the 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 whole you know the holistic view like in for example i've been i've been uh, ha i'm writing stuff now about like long distance travel and short distance travel one of the things that i've been working on recently in in there i i'm i've been assigned to those segments so i have to think of all of the things that were downtime that you know that they used for these kinds of travels and i also have to think of how is the uptime have impacted it and, well, and, in, and in, in you, a, you used it in the transylvania decision with the you know the uh, uh both the tanks the aircraft uh, I mean, all these things had to be taken into consideration within the logistics of, of moving the Army of the Sunrise and their opposition moving back and forth you know, along Transylvania. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nothing ever goes away. Right? <laughs> no, no, nothing. And uh, actually, yeah, the the uh, the work that I did in Transylvania Decision will help to inform my uh, rewriting of the tactical movement segment of, of, of the supplements. So that's one thing that I'm working on. <clears throat> I'm also working on two, um, two novellas. Um, I have written a story and a novella in the past, uh, with one of my characters called Chamalis Burton. Chamalis Burton is a, is a, a Native American. She's of Zuni, a Native American descent. She works for the FBI. She works for the Federal Bureau of Investigation of Violent Paranormal Activity Division. <clears throat> and uh, I wrote a novella that was published by Espec Books earlier this year called Eyes of the Wolf. Uh, you can find it on Amazon if you if you look, Eyes of the Wolf, Robert Waters. It's a, uh, it's a story about a Central American cryptid creature called the La El Cadejo. And it's basically a half goat, half uh, wolf creature. And she investigates the, uh, the basically the, the, the rising of that creature in, into Central and, and Southern, South uh, America. <clears throat> and I'm writing two, I'm working on two novellas that will continue her adventures or her investigations into it. Uh, uh, again, about Native American cryptids. That's, that's her specialty. She works by, primarily in North America and she investigates violent paranormal activity and the thing. So I'm working on two novellas um, in that, and hopefully, uh, you know, one of them at least will see the light of day next year. We'll see. Um, and so that's what I'm working on. That's that's uh, what I have in the pipeline at this time. Well, good deal. Well, thank you very much for uh, being with us today, Robert. Uh, much appreciated for your time. And uh, this has been the Bain Free Radio Hour with Griffin Barber and uh, interviewing Robert E. Waters concerning 1637, the Transylvanian decision. Good day. Thank you, guys. And now we bring you Timothy Zahn's Cobra.
Earth's only hope was the Cobras. The colony worlds Adirondack and Silvern fell to the troughed forces almost without a struggle. Outnumbered and on the defensive, Earth made a desperate decision. It would attack the aliens not from space, but on the ground, with forces the troughs did not even suspect. Thus were created the Cobras, a guerrilla force whose weapons were surgically implanted, invisible to the unsuspecting eye, yet undeniably deadly. But power brings temptation, and not all the Cobras could be trusted to fight for Earth alone. Johnny Moreau would learn the uses and abuses of his special abilities and what it truly meant to be a Cobra. Veteran, 2407. The late afternoon sunlight glinted whitely off the distant mountains as the shuttle came to rest with only a slight bounce. Army issue satchel slung over his shoulder, Johnny stepped out onto the landing pad, eyes darting everywhere. He had never been all that familiar with Horizon City, but even to him it was obvious the place had changed. There were half a dozen new buildings visible from the port, and one or two older ones had disappeared. The landscaping around the area had been redone with what looked like newly imported off-world varieties, as if the city were making a concerted effort to shake off its frontier world status. But the wind was blowing in from the north, across the plains and forests that were as yet untouched by man, and with it came the sweet sour aroma that no cultural aspirations could disguise. Three years ago, Johnny would hardly have noticed the scent. Now it was almost as if Horizon itself had contrived to welcome him home. Taking a deep breath of the perfume, he stepped off the pad and walked the hundred meters to a long, one-story building labeled Horizon Customs Entry Point. Opening the outer door, he stepped inside. A smiling man awaited him by a waist-high counter. Hello, Mr. Morrow. Welcome back to Horizon. I'm sorry, should I call you C-3 Morrow? Mr. is fine. Johnny smiled. I'm a civilian now. Of course, of course, the man said. He was still smiling, but there seemed to be just a trace of tension behind the geniality. And glad of it, I suppose. I'm Hearty Bell, the new head of customs here. Your luggage is being brought from the shuttle. In the meantime, I wonder if I might inspect your satchel. Just a formality, really. Sure. Johnny slid the bag off his shoulder and placed it on the counter. The faint hum of his servos touched his inner ear as he did so, sounding strangely out of place against the gentle haze of boyhood memories. Bell took the satchel and pulled, as if trying to bring it a few centimeters closer to him. It moved maybe a centimeter. Bell nearly lost his balance. Throwing an odd look at Johnny, he apparently changed his mind and opened the bag where it lay. By the time he finished, Johnny's two other cases had been brought in. Bell went through them with quick efficiency, made a few notations on his comm board, and finally looked up again, smile still in place. "'All set, Mr. Morrow,' he said. "'You're free to go.' "'Thanks.' Johnny put his satchel over his shoulder once more and transferred the other two bags from the counter to the floor. "'Is Transcape Rentals still in business? I'll need a car to get to Cedar Lake.' "'Sure is, but they've moved three blocks farther east. Want to call a taxi?' Thanks, I'll walk. Johnny held out his right hand. For just a moment, the smile slipped. Then, almost warily, Bell took the outstretched hand. He let go as soon as he politely could. Picking up his bags, Johnny nodded at Bell and left the building. Mayor Teague Stillman shook his head tiredly as he turned off his comm board and watched page 200 of the latest land-use proposal disappear from the screen. He would never cease to be amazed at how much word work the Cedar Lake City Council was able to generate. About a page a year, he'd once estimated, for every one of the town's 16,000 citizens. Either official magforms have learned how to breed, he told himself as he rubbed vigorously at his eyes, or else someone's importing them. Whichever, the troughs are probably behind it. There was a tap on his open door and Stillman looked up to see Councillor Sutton Fraser standing in the doorway. "'Come on in,' he invited. Fraser did so, closing the door behind him. "'Too drafty for you?' Stillman asked mildly as Fraser sat down on one of the mayor's guest chairs. "'I got a call a few minutes ago from Hardy Bell out at the Horizon Port,' Fraser began without preamble. 
Johnny Moreau's back. Stillman stared at the other for a moment, then shrugged slightly. He had to come eventually. The war's over, after all. Most of the soldiers came back weeks ago. Yeah, but Johnny's not exactly an ordinary soldier. Hardy said he lifted a satchel that must have weighed thirty kilos with one hand, effortlessly. The kid could probably tear a building apart if he got mad. Relax, Sut. I know the Moreau family. Johnny's a very even-tempered sort of guy. Was, you mean, Fraser said darkly. He's been a cobra for three years now, killing troughs and watching them kill his friends. Who knows what that's done to him? Probably instilled a deep dislike for war, if he's like most soldiers. Aside from that, it hasn't done too much, I'd guess. You know better than that, Teague. The kid's dangerous. That's a simple fact. Ignoring it isn't going to do you any good. Calling him dangerous is? What are you trying to do, start a panic? I doubt that any panic's going to need my help to get started. Everybody in town's seen the idiot plate reports on our heroic forces. They all know how badly the Cobras chewed up the troughs on Adirondack and Silvern. Stillman sighed. Look, I'll admit there may be some problems with Johnny's readjustment to civilian life. Frankly, I would have been happier if he'd stayed in the service. But he didn't. Like it or not, Johnny's home. And we can either accept it calmly or run around screaming doom. He risked his life out there. The least we can do is to give him a chance to forget the war and vanish back into the general population. Yeah, maybe. Fraser shook his head slowly. It's not going to be an easy road, though. Look, as long as I'm here, maybe you and I could draft some sort of announcement about this to the press, try to get a jump on the rumors. A good idea. Hey, cheer up, Sut. Soldiers have been coming home ever since mankind started having wars. We should be getting the hang of this by now. Yeah, Fraser growled. Except that this is the first time since swords went out of fashion that soldiers have gotten to take their weapons home with them. Stillman shrugged helplessly. It's out of our hands. Come on, let's get to work. Johnny pulled up in front of the Moreau home and turned off the car engine with a sigh of relief. The roads between Horizon City and Cedar Lake were rougher than he remembered them, and more than once he'd wished he had spent the extra money to rent a hover, even though the weekly rate was almost double that for wheeled vehicles. But he made it, with a minimum of kidney damage, and that was what mattered. He stepped out of the car and retrieved his bags from the trunk, and as he set them down on the street a hand fell on his shoulder. He turned and looked five centimeters up into his father's smiling face. "'Welcome home, son,' Pierce Morrow said. Hi, Dadder, Johnny said, face breaking into a huge grin as he grasped the other's outstretched hand. How have you been? Pierce's answer was interrupted by a crash and shriek from the front door of the house. Johnny turned to see ten-year-old Gwen tearing across the lawn toward him, yelling like a banshee with a winning lottery ticket. Dropping into a crouch facing her, he opened his arms wide, and as she flung herself at him, he grabbed her around the waist, straightened up, and threw her a half-meter into the air above him. Her shrill laughter almost masked Pierce's sharp intake of breath. Catching his sister easily, Johnny lowered her back to the ground. Boy, you've sure grown, he told her. Pretty soon you'll be too big to toss around. Good, she panted. Then you can teach me how to arm wrestle. Come on and see my room, huh, Johnny? I'll be along in a little bit, he told her. I want to say hello to Mommer first. She in the kitchen? Yes, Pierce said. Why don't you go on ahead, Gwen? I'd like to talk to Johnny for a moment. Okay, she chirped. Squeezing Johnny's hand, she scampered back toward the house. She's got her room papered with articles and pictures from the past three years, Pierce explained as he and Johnny collected Johnny's luggage. Everything she could get hard copies of that had anything to do with the Cobras. You disapprove? Of what? That she idolizes you? Good heavens, no. Why? You seem a bit nervous. Oh, I guess I was a little startled when you tossed Gwen in the air a minute ago. I've been using the servos for quite a while now, Johnny pointed out mildly as they headed toward the house. I really do know how to use my strength safely. I know, I know. Hell, I used exoskeleton gear myself in the Minthistan War, you know, when I was your age. But it was pretty bulky, and you couldn't ever forget you were wearing it. I guess... Well, I suppose I was worried that you'd forget yourself. 
Johnny shrugged. Actually, I'm probably in better control than you ever were since I don't have to have two sets of responses, with power amp and without. The servos and ceramic lamini are going to be with me the rest of my life, and I've long since gotten used to them. Pierce nodded. Okay. He paused, then continued. Look, Johnny, as long as we're on the subject, the Army's letter to us said that most of your Cobra gear would be removed before you came home. What did they... I, I mean, what do you still have? Johnny sighed. I wish they'd just come out and listed the stuff instead of being coy like that. It makes it sound like I'm still a walking tank. The truth is that aside from the skeletal lamini and servos, all I have is the nanocomputer, which hasn't got much to do now except run the servos, and two small lasers in my little fingers, which they couldn't remove without amputation, and the servo power supply, of course. Everything else, the arc thrower capacitors, the anti-armor laser, and the sonic weapons are gone. So was the self-destruct, but that subject was best left alone. Okay, Pierce said. Sorry to bring it up, but your mother and I were a little nervous. That's all right. They were at the house now. Entering, they went to the bedroom Jamie had had to himself for the last three years. Where's Jamie, by the way? Johnny asked as he piled his bags by his old bed. Out at New Perseus, picking up a spare laser tube for the bodywork welder down at the shop. Uh, we've only got one working at the moment, and I can't risk it going out on us. Parts have been nearly impossible to get lately. A side effect of war, you know. He snapped his fingers. Say, those little lasers you have, can you weld with them? I can spot weld, yes. They were designed to work on metals, as a matter of fact. Great. Uh, maybe you could give us a hand until we can get parts for the other lasers. How about it? Johnny hesitated. Um, frankly, Dadder, I'd rather not. I don't... Well, the lasers remind me too much of... Uh, other things. I don't understand, Pierce said, a frown beginning to crease his forehead. Are you ashamed of what you did? No, of course not. I mean, I knew pretty much what I was getting into when I joined the Cobras. And looking back, I think I did as good a job as I could have. It's just... This war was different from yours, Dadder. A lot different. I was in danger, and was putting other people in danger the whole time I was on Adirondack. If you'd ever had to fight the Minthisti face to face, or had to help bury the bodies of uninvolved civilians caught in the fighting, he forced his throat muscles to relax, you'd understand why I'd like to try and forget all of it, at least for a while. Pierce remained silent for a moment. Then he laid a hand on his son's shoulder. You're right, Johnny. Fighting a war from a starship was a lot different. I'm not sure I can understand what you went through, but I'll do my best, okay? Yeah, Dadder. Thanks. Sure. Come on, let's go see your mother. Then you can go take a look at Gwen's room. That was another installment in Timothy Zahn's Cobra. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks, as always, to Audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to Robert E. Waters for sitting down with us today. And good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars.